Welcome back to the Stronger by Science channel. I am Dr. Pack, and today we're looking at the loads and whether they are overrated for strength and hypertrophy. Before we look at the current literature, a bit of background as far as deloads go. So up until recently, we had absolutely no research directly looking at the concept of deloads, despite deloading being a relatively common practice in both strength and physique sports, so powerlifting, weightlifting, strongman, and so on and so forth, as well as recreationally active lifting. Before the first ever study on deloads was published, there were already videos with hundreds of thousands of views, articles, and it's just a lot of content on the concept of deloads. And deloading was one of those things that people assumed was common knowledge, when in reality, it was more common belief. Welcome to the Philosophy by Science podcast. <laughs> it's not a podcast. Um, and shout out to James Steele for um, that quote. However, I digress. So let's first define what deloads are, which is something that we had to formally do in the literature um, by conducting a Delphi study. I was fortunate enough to be part of that project. This was not a project I spearheaded by any means, but I was fortunate enough to be part of that study that was ironically published after the first study on deloads was ever done. And on that Delphi study, the proposed definition for deloads is as follows. Deloading is a period of reduced training stress designed to mitigate physiological and psychological fatigue, promote recovery and enhance preparedness for subsequent training. This is a definition that essentially comes on the back of expert consensus and that was the purpose of this Delphi study. I'm not going to dive into the details of the Delphi study, but essentially the goal of that study, aside from defining what deloading is, was to also look at how deloads are integrated in strength and physique sport uh, programs uh, by essentially, again, taking a consensus approach. However, we're going to park this study on the side and we're going to look at specifically two studies. So the first study, a study that again, I had the honor of being involved with um, to a relatively heavy extent. And it's a study that has a very, very playful title because, hey, literature and titles within the literature don't necessarily have to be boring. You can't shoot another bullet until you've reloaded the gun. Coaches, perceptions, practices, and experiences of deloading in strength and physique sports. And this title actually caught some flack on a random podcast or something. Somebody had told me where one of the listeners was like, why is there a gun reference in the title? That's an actual quote from one of the coaches, obviously, uh, that was interviewed. This was an interview study, and it was the first ever study to directly look at the concept of deloads, spearheaded by Lee Bell et al. out of Sheffield Hallam University, shout out. And the goal of that study was to essentially interview strength and physique sport coaches to see, okay, what do some of the experts in the field have to say about deloads, their uses, and so on and so forth. Overall, we interviewed 18 very experienced strength and physique sport coaches, meaning coaches that did, that coached bodybuilders, powerlifters, strongmen and strongwomen, or Olympic weightlifters. And obviously, when I say bodybuilders, I mean physique category athletes, bikini athletes, and so on and so forth. Just anybody that competes in physique sports. Surprisingly, a good deal of those participants also had PhDs in um, a relevant field which was not something that we planned for or um, had any inclusion criteria that required them to have a PhD. They had various levels of both professional and academic experience, but they had all worked with extremely high level athletes. We're talking IFBB pros, IPF world champions. We're talking some Olympic level um, athletes. And just in general, they were very, very experienced coaches. The purpose of the study was to lay a base for future research in order to better understand the concept of deloads and essentially see where future research should focus 
its attention uh, as well as provide some practical takeaways for people that are looking to get jacked. Overall, both proactive and reactive deloads were used by coaches. Proactive meaning pre-planned deloads and reactive uh, meaning not planned deloads but taken when needed. Deloads were on average used as a way to dissipate fatigue and to allow for extended recovery. Interestingly, coaches noted that a taper and a deload are different, uh, but sometimes people use the two terms interchangeably. So a taper is supposed to allow fatigue to dissipate while allowing performance to increase before a specific event, having the athlete or individual ready for that specific event. Whereas deloads are just a way for individuals to dissipate fatigue and get ready for a subsequent training cycle, which was interesting because you often hear tapering and deloading sometimes being used interchangeably by both strength and physique sport coaches. When it comes to the actual recommendations, most deloads, uh, based on what the coaches said, are supposed to be roughly about a week and the volume should be cut down by 30 to 50 percent while intensity of effort, meaning how hard you're working at a given set, should also be cut down by a few reps in reserve. But overall, deloads were presented as an easy week of training where you go in the gym, you do some form of training, much less volume than before. Some coaches also expressed that you could experiment with different exercises during a deload for variation sake, but while keeping those exercises relatively similar to whatever you were doing before, just to avoid unwanted soreness and additional fatigue. So let's say you were doing a competition bench press during your usual training cycle, doing close grip bench press during your deload for again, relatively easy sets, not a big deal. Trying Atlas stones for the first time, probably not the best idea. However, things seem to be relatively flexible and reactive deloads were favored versus proactive deloads. So taking a deload when the athlete needed it and that was essentially indicated by things like overall feeling and perception of fatigue, soreness, as well as a regression in training performance. So from this study, we essentially got the idea that deloads are not supposed to peak an athlete for a specific event or peak their performance, but simply allow them to rest so they can then resume hard training and push themselves hard for more time. However, this was just an interview study. Still a very important and a solid base. And obviously we're talking about highly experienced coaches, but this was not an intervention study. Enter Coleman et al. 2024, straight out of the Applied Muscle Development Lab, the AMDL, which I am proudly a part of, and I was fortunate enough to also be involved in this particular study, I actually traveled to New York for some of its data collection. This was a study led by the infamous or famous Max Coleman, who is an up and coming researcher in our world and has published plenty of papers. Be sure to check him out. Check out his research gate profile, which he totally had before he met me. So on to the study though. This was the first intervention study to formally explore the concept of deload. So looking at the study, 39 resistance trained individuals did lower body resistance training for either. So the one group was the continuous group that did not take a deload. They did nine weeks of nonstop training. And then we had the deload group that did four weeks of training, deloaded for one week by taking a complete week off and then continued their training. Both strength and hypertrophy were assessed post training intervention, as well as a few other variables. Now, the participants performed relatively high volume routines and uh, were training to failure. They essentially did a bunch of volume for their legs and the program was designed in a way to not only allow for potentially optimal hypertrophy gains, but also to be relatively hard so that a deload can be justified. Overall, both groups made gains and there were no differences as far as hypertrophy went between the group that took the week off and the group that didn't. As far as strength goes, the group that did not take a week off saw greater improvements in both dynamic and isometric strength. Although terms and conditions apply, it's not like the other group lost a bunch of strength and they were doomed or anything of that sort. 
However, it's important to note that the group that continued training did uh, manage to do better in terms of dynamic and isometric strength. It's also important to note that some of the participants of the study did express that they did not feel like they needed a deload and we're talking about a period of time that was just four weeks of continuous training. If we were to look at the interview study that I mentioned previously and see how often coaches recommended deloads, as I mentioned, coaches recommended that reactive deloads may be more appropriate than proactive deloads where traditionally people would deload every four to six weeks, regardless of whether they felt like deloading. The coaches did recommend that people wait until they're fatigued enough and then take a deload. And this study does not necessarily confirm this 100%, but the uh, participants, some of them at least, did express that they did not feel like they needed a deload at four weeks. And although that did not negatively affect their hypertrophy, it did seem to have some form of a negative effect on their strength, which may have not been the case if they actually needed the deload, something that is purely speculative and it's just a guess. It may have been that the results would have been exactly the same. Anyways, I digress. But overall, it does seem that you do not need to overthink deloads. So if we combine the data from the interview study and the intervention study and the multitude of approaches that highly experienced um, coaches take towards deloading, as well as the fact that these participants, although resistance trained, did not make less muscle growth gains uh, where after a complete week off. Yes, they did lose some strength, but I would argue that had they still included some training in their program versus taking a complete week off, those were prob would probably be fine. And even if they weren't, it's likely that those would resume back to baseline or slightly above baseline after a week of training. But overall, it seems like as long as you're taking an easy week of training, when you're feeling very fatigued and when potentially performance has started regressing, then you're totally fine. Make sure you're doing less volume than you were doing before, approximately 30 to 50% less. And at the same time, you do not need to overthink whether you're going to do two sets on a particular exercise versus three, or whether you're gonna lift on every day or just two days versus the four days that you usually do. Even if you take the week completely off, you're likely to be totally fine. If we also take a quick peek at some of the training cessation literature, we also see that even longer periods uh, away from the gym are still fine as far as hypertrophy goes. Although on average, if you're somebody who's looking to maximize your gains and you've reached the point of a deload one week, of reduced training volume and just reduced intensity of effort seems to do the trick just fine. As far as the idea of deloads resensitizing muscle growth, the evidence for that is still lacking. I do recommend though that you do check an older article by Stronger by Science called Grow Like a New Lifter Again, link in the description. But the idea that the deload will somehow magically accelerate your gains and you must take a deload every four to six weeks or whatever the number is uh, in order to reset things and resensitize growth is unfortunately or fortunately for many of you not based on much at least as it stands however there are cases where pre-planning your deloads is great obviously competitions and if you're a strength athlete you'd need to do that in the form of a taper anyways but if you're also somebody who travels a lot or you have a few life events that are in the calendar and have, and have been there for a while saying, oh, cool, I have a wedding to go to in 12 weeks and I'll be traveling out of the country and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to train then. Therefore, I'm going to push training until then and take a deload week in the form of a week off training or an easy week of whatever bodyweight training I can fit in. So that's a way where you can integrate proactive deloads in your training and make them work for you. However, if for any reason you have a preference for deloading every X amount of weeks, although I would urge you to not necessarily force deloads every four weeks or way too frequently, it's okay. It's not going to be the end of the world for your gains, but on average, if you are taking an easy week of training every three to four weeks, even though you don't need it, you may be missing out on potential gains in the future because you'll simply be training less than if you were to take the deload week whenever you needed it or every eight to 12 weeks. Other than that, 
deloads are one of these areas in um, the literature that we still need to explore more. We need studies looking at whether different types of deloads are better than others, but overall it does seem like a week off from the gym or an easy week of training is not only going to help you manage your fatigue better, but it's not gonna have a negative effect on your gains. That said, last but definitely not least, when we talk to some of the coaches in the interview study and ask them if they do think that deloads are necessary, some did express that they did, they did not think that deloads were necessary. And I would argue that if you're somebody who naturally deloads or your training volume sort of fluctuates from week to week or month to month, depending on how busy you are and other things going on in your life, you may not need to deload for quite a while. So if you have the odd week here and there where you're so busy at work and you only manage a couple of sessions versus four sessions um, a week, then you are essentially de semi deloading here and there and sort of resetting that um, fatigue sort of bar or whatever analogy you want to use. Um, and you don't necessarily need to worry about a deload unless you feel like you need a deload. That's it. Deloads, not such a big deal. Don't fall for the jargon and the mumbo jumbo. Just make sure to take it easy whenever you need to and don't sweat the details too much. These studies that I discussed are in the description alongside some other studies if you want to do some extra reading on deloads. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the notification icon. That's the like icon. I apologize. And obviously check out strongerbyscience.com. Check out the Stronger by Science podcast, strongerbyscience.com slash coaching for evidence-based coaching. And we will catch you guys next time. Peace.